My Gavan and Melunin, and well met indeed. I am Arachir Gala, Jonathan, head of the modding team behind Divide and Conquer, and welcome back to Divide and Conquer as we bring another developer diary. Now, this one is likely to be a little short, um, and uh, but there's a relatively large amount of changes that have gone on, so I thought, why the hell not? Let's show off some of Dak's new changes. We start up here, of course, with the renovation of Angma, and um, they now have new campaign strategy models for their generals. So, Agandawa, your faction leader, Overlord Agandawa the Merciless, um, now has his own bespoke campaign strategy model that looks exactly like he does in the War in the North video game. Standing just to his left is now a generic captain of the forces of Angma. Um, I've got the sound muted at the moment because the voices aren't all set up properly and it's just easier to mute the sound than have odd noises playing in the background. But um, I'll turn it back on in a, in a moment and you'll see why. But for the moment there's no sound. But um, that is what a standard captain looks like. Chief Hoonvorn, your current faction heir and of course the Wraith of Cardolan. He still looks like a Wraith, which is pretty cool. Morholt still has the Ruadar look, of course, and he still has men of Ruadar or Ruadar Huskals now as his bodyguard. And, uh, and there he is, standing in all his glory. And then down here is the new generic human general for Angmar. Uh, there he is, with a little crown representing, of course, the Iron Crown. And wearing the armour of the uh, Angmarim elites. So those are some of the changes to Angmar. Angmar, of course, are not yet finished, nowhere near. But the changes are being made. The UI, as you can see, is now being implemented and added. So they now actually have the correct UIs. Um, they still need uh, their descriptions to be written. Um, there's no surprises there, is it? <laughs> I'm slow with those. We'll take a look at the Witch Knights um, on the battle map in just a moment. But the bodyguard of Angmar has been renamed to Witch Knights. So those are now the standard bodyguard for Angmar. And you can get a brief glimpse of them there, but we'll see them, as I say, in the second half. So, some other changes for the campaign map, or for every faction, are um, as follows. Stamina has been addressed across the entire game. Um, and so every faction, every nation, every unit has been looked at and assessed, and stamina has been sort of... Well, I've said addressed already, but uh, stamina has been made so that there aren't any glaring errors anymore with with militia units that have higher stamina than elites, things like that. There shouldn't be any erroneous stamina levels anymore. Um, let me just turn those back on for you. Um, so stamina is number one. Um, some changes from RK, always nice to see. The battle map for Imladris has been edited slightly and our testers have um, confirmed that the improvements are indeed taking effect. And the battle map is now considerably more user friendly. It's easier to place troops, it's easier to fight, the AI handles it better. Uh, and so it's, it's a bit better fighting there than it was before. Uh, obviously it's quite a, a, a tricky battle map at the best of times in terms of getting your troops lined up. But now it just is a little bit easier. Wild Men Towns have also been edited. Uh, Wild Men Towns, so um, Dunrak is not a town, it's a large town. Dunyard, there we are. So these towns on the battle map are now different. They have an extra gate and entrance and path to the square, which is on, in the, at the, on the top of that hill. Um, so previously there's a gate down here on this side. The, the campaign map model looks very much like the battle map model. Uh, and there's a gate here and there's a gate over there. But there's a new gate being added over there. So there are now three ways into the town, making it a bit harder to defend than it was before. Previously it was a very easy defensive town. And RK um, has taken it upon himself to make it a little harder, a little more challenging. And a little bit more like a town with more entrances rather than just two. Uh, so there's, you'll see that change there. Now, another thing that has been addressed across the board is morale. And morale has been addressed in every unit. Um, and I'm not going to just read through the list because it's... Um, but I'll, I'll read the maximum. So every faction now has a minimum stamina, uh, morale level that any of their units might have. So the lowest of their units, their militia. And they also now have a maximum morale that their most elite units will have. Um, and they go in the following order. So dwarves have the highest possible morale of 28. Now only certain units will get those. So for example, there'll be a dwarven unit with 28 morale, but most of the dwarven units will be between 18 and 28. So that's for the dwarves. Their minimum is now 18 and their maximum is 28. For the elves, the minimum is 17 and the max is 26. So the dwarves' love of battle um, gives them a bit more morale over the elves. Next up is Gundabad with 16 and then 25. Uh, representing again their sort of major love of, um, 
uh, of battle, but Hummingbird has written a note to see that they don't have any units with locked morale. So Gundabad have good morale, but none of their units have locked morale, so some of them may well run away. Uh, the Dunedain and the Arar Danaim are next, so Northern Dunedain, Gondor and Dol Amroth. And the Arar Danaim, they have a minimum of 15 and a maximum of 24, so it's going down in increments of one or two. Um, and they are the only human factions with a unit that does have locked morale. So the, the four Numenorean descendant nations um, are the only humans with locked morale, which is quite good. The Northmen, so Dorwinian, Dale and Rohan, along with Rune, Harad, Kand, Angmar and the Anduin, all have a max of 22. So a two point jump between them and the Dunedain uh, and a minimum of 13. These numbers I appreciate will mean very little, but they just give you an idea of the scale that is being used and the, the minor difference between units. Uh, next up is Middlemen. So, oh, sorry, Cand are in the Middlemen group. So that's Bree, Dunland, Enidwyth, Ruadawa, uh, Men of Ruadawa, separate from Angmar, Isengard, and Cand. They all have a max of only 20. So, eight points of morale behind the leaders, the dwarves. Which may sound like a lot, but trust me, morale isn't actually that different in the levels. And um, a point of one or two is not a massive change. A, a difference of 10 will certainly you'll feel the difference, but a difference of one or two, not too much. Uh, Mordor and Dol Guldur are in 7th, um, with their maximum being 18, except for unique special human units who will follow other lines, like the Dark Numenorians will have Numenorean style morale. And then finally, as you might expect, propping up the board is the m faction Moria, the Goblins of Moria, sorry. Uh, they now have a maximum of 18 as well, but their minimum is the lowest at 10. Uh, Mordor and Dol Guldur have a minimum of 11. So the difference between the Dwarves and Moria, who are the best and worst respectively, um, the Dwarves minimum is 18 and the Goblin minimum is 10. So an only 8 point difference between their Militia. And between their Elites there is a 10 point difference of 28 plays 18. So it, the morale, although that may you, some of you may come out and say, oh I think this faction should be lower than this one or higher than that one, it really is only a very minor difference and it's just one of those things that we like to get the units in order, because order is... Paramount. Mordor reigns supreme. Um, order, sorry, not Mordor. And um, it's, so it's just nice to have every unit now conforming to a structure that we've implemented, and that's the purpose of it. So the difference won't be felt that much, trust me. Next up, crossbows have been tweaked. Hummingbird discovered a previously unknown animation that is available to us for a faster firing crossbow. Now, the, th the thought had been to add this animation to the dwarves, but unfortunately, because dwarves are short, um, it, by giving them the animation, they then levitate above the ground, and we decided, obviously, that is too game-breaking, because it's a, it's a bug. Um, so what has happened is the following. Um, Every post barracks event human and Urukai crossbow units, and I say Urukai because only Isengard have an Urukai crossbow. So the Isengard Urukai crossbows, and then any post barracks event human crossbow units now have a faster firing animation. Um, so it helps differentiate factions like Dorwinian, who have a pre barracks event and a post barracks event crossbow. They now there's a difference between their units, which is very good. However, the Dwarves, in order to stay ahead as the best crossbowmen in Middle-earth, they have been given a boost to their range, accuracy and damage. So the Guard of the Hand, for example, might well fire faster than Erud Lewin's um, crossbowmen, who are the best in the game. Broadbeam Marksmen, they're called. Uh, but the Broadbeam Marksmen will fire further, so they'll shoot the Guard of the Hand before they're in range of before the hand can shoot them back. Uh, they are far more accurate with each shot and they do more damage with each shot. So it's very much one of those kind of two to one situations. The dwarves only need one shot to get a kill. Um, the guard of the hand need two. But the guard of the hand might be able to fire two shots or three shots in the time that the broadbeam marksman can fire two. So it's a quantity over quality kind of thing. But the dwarves, rest assured, are are the best. So the fast firing animation hasn't changed the balance at all, really. Um, and while it's a nice little nod that your elites are better than your non-elites, you're still not as good as the dwarves. So the dwarves are um, especially good. Another change, which has been long coming, um, it's listed as for the AI, but I can't help but also feel it is to pander, unfortunately, to those who just simply do not understand a simple Med 2 mechanic, and that is that you can't train any units until you have built a building that comes with recruitment slots allowed. 
Um, again, I've just literally, st before I started recording this episode, I had to again tell someone on YouTube in the comments because he came to us and he said, I've had a bug on three save files whereby I can't train any units in XYZ region. It's like, oh, for God's sake, just read the bloody welcome message. But anyway, um, I digress. I'm, I'm moaning. Gondor now have a load of pre-built level one town halls so that the AI can train units quicker and partially so that humans... People who are supposedly um, intelligent with with brains um, can also now train units with um, a little bit of hand holding. Um, I'm not currently playing as Gondor, so I can't show you. But the following towns: Pelagir, Kalembel, which is over here, and uh, Lond Gallen. So those three have been given level one town halls so that you can train out of them immediately. Uh, it also has been those three have been chosen because a large quantity of your fiefdom units comes from those three regions and uh, so it helps the AI get their fiefdom units out a bit earlier so that you might get a bit more variety when attacking Gondor. Uh, so that is very very good. And then finally before we jump over to the battle map and have a look at some nice new units and some new visuals, um, the battle map for Austin Ethiel, which looks very much like the strategy model there, um, it's obviously a ruined elven town, there's no walls and um, it's atop a little hill. Well that battle map is now also used in Etheland. The campaign strategy model will remain as an elven city because it looks nice, um, but the battle map is now a ruined city. So you can still upgrade it though if you take it as Dol Amroth or Gondor because it's only a city at the moment and you can go to large city. But um, it will be a... Whilst the campaign strategy model looks like it's going to be a nice big elven town, it is actually a ruin and relatively difficult to defend. So That's the last change campaign map wise. And now as I say, we'll jump onto the battle map. And uh, I've got various new units to show you. And one unit that I think many people are going to absolutely love the return of... Um, and uh, we shall see, We'll uh, looks like Treebeard and his friends may finally come back from their wanderings in the south. They've got enough sun now, and their suntan lotion has run out, and they've got to head home. And uh, so we'll see them in just a moment. Welcome then to the battle map, and I've just been flicking through these units, and the nostalgia feel is so, so real. Um, welcome, of course, we're starting off with, um, let me turn on the UIs, wrong one, uh, wrong one. Seven, there we are. Um, oh, they never get the hang of these bloody keys. Right, we're starting off with Angmar then. So, changes to Angmar. The Mount Gram Raiders, who are the ones without a... Um, uh, without a... Uh, UI at the moment. Oh, hang on, that would suggest that. Oh, yes, no, there we are. I'm, the names are wrong. From in my head, sorry. Uh, right, so Mount Gram Raiders, which, as I say, are the ones here without a UI... They are now the archer, elite archer orc for Angmar's cavalry force. <laughs> so you've obviously got the two earlier tier warg units that are just called warg marauders and warg raiders. And now you've got Mount Graham raiders and Mount Graham marauders. And the raiders are archers, as you can see here. And then the marauders have been changed. They no longer are a javelin unit. Um, they are now a kind of heavy cavalry elite charge unit, as you can see. So your early tier units, there's a warg archer and a warg javelin. And then your late tier cavalry, there is a warg archer and a warg heavy hitter. Uh, and these are the Mount Graham... Oh, I've done this the wrong bloody way around, haven't I? Sorry. And the reason I'm lining them up like that behind one another is because you will also note that there is a visual armor upgrade. So the Mount Graham marauders have uh, the chainmail look there. And then they upgrade to having this elite kind of heavy armor look. Goodness, the volume is much louder in my head. Uh, hopefully it's not too loud in the video. But the other thing, of course, is that voices have been added. And if you've ever played the Battle for Middle-earth 2, the Rise of the Witch King expansion pack, then buckle up, because you're going to enjoy this. We serve the Iron Crown. In the name of the Witch King, none can stand against us. I speak with the Witch King's voice. We fight for Angmar. Let's take him hunting. Keep your wolves under control. Keep your wolves under control. Fear the Iron Crown. I am the Fist of Angmar. We fight for the Iron Crown. None can stand against us. <laughs> there we are. It's brilliant, isn't it? The other thing that I wanted to show you that I didn't show you last time is, of course, the Barrow Whites. And there they are. 
goodness, I really do hope it's not as loud for you as that was for me, because <laughs> it's going to make someone jump. Um, so there's the new, obviously, visual of the Barrowites. They used to be the officer unit for the Barrowites. Now they are just the standard general, the, the standard body uh, unit. My words are, as ever, escaping me. And the Witch Knights, as I say, the new bodyguard for Angmar. Here they are, wearing the armor that is... Of course, used by the Dark Numenorians in Mordor. And indeed, the Dark Blade unit, your kind of elite quasi-ranger unit. I speak with the Witch King's voice. And there are the Witch Knights. You will also note that the Banner Carriers have been updated. And they now carry the Iron Crown. And they indeed are no longer Orcs. Nor are they Men of Ruadar. So they have also been updated. Uh, and a little officer has been added in each instance. Now, my actual captain... These have been edited and amended as well. And this is a new Angmarim captain. There he is with his chain mail and, and whatever tabard that is, someone will tell me. Um, and then, of course, the visual upgrades run through all three Iron Crown units. So, Iron Crown warriors starting there with whatever that is, with the Iron Crown on the chest. And then they upgrade again to that heavy armor. And it's the same as I say throughout. So there's the Halberdiers following that same pattern. And that's it, I believe. Um, oh, the Longbowmen. Did I not have the Longbowmen? Yes, sorry. And there they are. The Longbowmen at the back. So again, with that armour upgrade. So there we are. Angmar really taking shape now, looking like a professional fighting force. And basically just being based on the Battle of Middle-earth, Rise of the Witch King. Except they are not Black Numenorians. They are just middlemen, if you will. Humans who never crossed over to Beleriand. They stayed in Middle-earth. And then later on in the histories, of course, the Witch King came to Angmar and mustered them against the Numenorians. At no point were Black Numenorians fighting for or in Kandum. And they are men of Kandum. They lived there before the Witch King came and before, quite importantly, before the Numenorians came. Uh, I just want to make that very clear. Right, we jump over then to Dol Guldur, but we're going to have to start the battle and pause it because they've got hidden units. There they are. Um, so there won't be any sound now. Dol Guldur have had a few changes. First and foremost, the Goblin Headhunter unit has changed name to Goblin Stalkers. So they are an, a hide anywhere javelin throwing unit. Um, and they were now called Goblin Stalkers. Their model has been adapted and turned into a Poison Archer unit who now have the name Goblin Headhunters. Dolgaldor are being turned very much into the kind of Enid Wyth of the Orc factions. They are going to be sneaky, they are going to be all about skirmishing and hiding. They are no longer going to be about elites, which brings me on to Kamul's Shadow Rangers now have the look of the old Shadow Bows because Kamul's Shadow Bows have been cut from the game. So the Easterling aspect of the Dol Guldur army has been lessened significantly and now there is only the knights, the halberdiers and the archers. There's no longer two archers and they're also now much rarer units as well. So Dol Guldur cannot place as much emphasis or you can't rely as much on your elite humans anymore. Also, the Mirkwood Uruk pikes have been taken out of the game and their model has now been given a large two-handed weapon of mass destruction. And uh, they charge into the battlefield now as strike infantry. So you no longer have that pike unit. It's more aggression, skirmish and um, force over um, before, which was just a clone of Mordor. So um, a nice change there. In addition, this unit has been added. You'll note they don't have a name yet. They are called To Be Done, um, which translates into other languages. We need to actually get off our ass and do something. And um, I say we, I mean me. <laughs> Laziness is my greatest trait. But uh, they're a post-barracks event javelin throwing wag unit. So again, focusing on that skirmishing effect. They're not going to be anywhere near as good as Angmar's javelin wags, um, who aren't currently on this battlefield. But they are still a wag javelin unit available to you. Next up then is, ah yes, the Mountain Orc Hunters have finally had their visuals redone. Um, and they no longer wear the skull helmet thing. And they um, have just been toned down a little bit in terms of... I mean, they've been been—they've just been enhanced in quality, really. They have now they now use, um, courtesy of Louis Lux, I believe it's Louis Lux, they now use the much superior head texture that is used on the half-orcs of Isengard. So that's been ported over to them. Their body colouring has been amended and edited to match their head. And they've now got different, um, various different styles of clothing, as you can see as well. They no longer just wear a rag. They actually have a, 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 a more a loincloth than a rag, I would su suggest. And you'll note that there's furs a bit more prevalent throughout as well. 
So, um, not a massive change, but just a nice little polish, a, a tidying up of the unit, if you will. So those are the Mountain Orc Hunters, available to both Moria and Gundabad, but to the latter um, much in much lesser numbers than to the former. And we'll go the other way down the line, even though I've already told you exactly what it is. I want to wait to last because I'm so pleased that they're back in the game. But um, Dunland have been edited up and the Chieftain's Bodyguard have been given the old visual of the Dunlending Raiders, who now have this look with the um, fur over their mail. So um, no longer does Dunland's Bodyguard now just look like a clone of the wolf units. They now have their own visual appearance, um, which is always, always ideal. And, and hold that thought in your head because that's where we're going in a moment with another faction but uh, so just a few changes there to Dunland's visuals and that coincides with something I probably should have spoken of in the first half of the video um, which is that Dunland are going to be changed in that the Dunland Rising script is going to be removed from the game um, I have always been a proponent of removing it from the game because I have never been a fan of it um, but there was a lot of work that went into it and Dunland up until then never really had their own identity they were a real tacked on faction and so it gave them at least something to stand out but I feel like it it wasn't really a good way of standing out and Hummingbird now also agreed as did many testers and so the Dunland Rising script is gone you no longer have to be in the top 10 to get um, Eisenmach units, you no longer have to be in the top eight to get ports or siege, whichever one came next, and then top six to get the last of those ports or siege, whichever one you couldn't get before. So there's no longer this arbitrary restriction on your recruitment. You are just like any other wild men faction now. And it will make the AI Dunland no different whatsoever because they weren't affected by the rising script. So if you're thinking, oh, Dunland will be more of a challenge, they already weren't affected by it. So there's no change to the AI. But as a human, you might find Dunland a bit more entertaining. But because the Eisenmack Raiders are now available sooner, you, they are no longer as good as they were before and they've been brought down to match the wolf units in stats. So a little bit of a change there. And now we jump over to Isengard who have had some wonderful visual changes and we start with their bodyguards who now have their own visual appearance. There it is. They look like the officer unit for each battalion. Now I know some of you may think, oh gosh, no, that's, uh, I don't like the white helmet. Well, personally, A, I love the white helmet, so fight me. And um, B, we need the bodyguards to stand out. It's very useful on the battlefield to be able to see straight away, that is my bodyguard unit, and not look at this mass of black and gray and think, oh God, who? where's my general in all this? I know you can select your general and press the delete button, and it will hover in, for example, no matter where you are on the battle map, it will zoom you in to be looking directly at your captain or your general. He'll always be in the center of your screen when it does that little um, fix at the end. But equally, when you're just scanning the battlefield, it's useful to know roughly where your generals are. And so the bodyguard now stands out with the white helmets, which I am very pleased with. Some minor changes have been made as well, courtesy of Reforged to the Urukai Archers and Urukai Raiders. You'll note that some of them now have leather helmets, so they're not all bareheaded anymore. There's a little bit of a variety there. Um, just those little leather helmets. They look like the Nightingale Cowl from Skyrim, <laughs> in my opinion. But there we are. Uh, the Guard of the Hand have also been given slightly different helmets, as you can see, with a white hand embossed on the front, uh, and they look even more menacing than they did before, swiftly becoming one of my favourite visual units, I think. They look so good, and they're so good as a unit. They, um, they really are a nice one. Also, the Nazkai, you might be able to just see them all clutching in their right hand is a bomb now. Um, a little black one with white lines all over it. Um, so they have now been given their naphtha bombs, uh, so they will throw those in battle before they charge in. And lastly, a few really very, very, very minor visual tweaks to Orthanc Guard. Um, they now, rather than being barehanded, they have male gloves and their shields have been increased in size um, to make them just feel a little bit more elite. And because who doesn't love a bloody massive shield? <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> so there we are. And then finally, you've seen them before. I've spoken of it for a long time. 
and I just showed you on the campaign map as well. We've turned Ents into trolls. They are now infantry and they use the troll animation and Hummingbird has now amended them so that they match the animation better uh, because when I made the change in the coding I was unable to edit the model because I don't know how to do that and um, so they worked as as trolls but the, 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 the kind of like 10 foot Ent battle model still applied to them so when they ran along the floor um, they were actually running on their knees and their feet would clip through the floor every time they took a step. It was very entertaining, uh, but of course a massive bug. But now they are actually just trolls, as you can see there. Um, and as you will also note, the game is not crashing despite them being here because trolls never crash the game. I've seen some people say in comments that trolls do crash their game, but I assure you, friend, it is not the trolls. And it'll be a quirk of the system, um, a missing texture possibly, if it's back in the day. It may be that your computer just reached its RAM limit, any of the above. But trolls don't crash the game merely by having them present. And so Ents no longer do either. So we haven't made any changes yet, but I plan to now bring the Ents back. So the script that sends them into Fangorn Forest when you walk in, I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm simply just going to put the Ents back into Fangorn Forest. In addition, of course, I may, I haven't discussed this with the team yet, but I may look into possibly giving Lothlorien um, some form of building that allows them to train Ents. But... Um, we will have to wait and see. And ideally as well in time, if possible, we may return the Isengard Ent script. But I'm not entirely sold on that because it often had the unfortunate side effect of completely annihilating Isengard and thus giving Rohan an absolute walkover of a battle. So, uh, walkover of a victory. So we may not reimpose the Ent attack script, but Ents will certainly be more common now. Uh, but certainly for Lothlorien, who are, of course, border them. And in this Total War setting, um, we've gone with that the Ents would get involved. Of course, they're not as tall as you might hope them to be, standing the same height as a troll, but the um, the model's kind of leaves and branches does make them stand a little taller than trolls. But uh, to be honest, I think you can all agree that having Ents of a slightly smaller proportion, but having Ents is preferred to just never having them because they broke the game. So, the Ents are back. I've also got the Galathrim March Wardens here because it says in the notes that they have been given a visual upgrade. Um, but I can't see that they have, unless I have very foolishly not upgraded one of them. Which may well be the case. Uh, because I personally can't see anything different between the two. Um, and so I think I've not upgraded them. <laughs> which is foolish, um, on my part. So there we are, those are the changes for this developer diary, number 15 I believe. Um, we are really getting down to it in terms of polishing and preparing these factions now. Um, and they are standing very ready for war. Let's charge our wargs in. It's taken for a run! Come on boyos. Oh, the other very, very minor amendment, I wasn't going to add it in, but it's just popped into my head, so I'll say it. Um, all of the wargs have been given a slightly faster running speed because their animation is actually quite slow. So they've been sped up in terms of their uh, actual running, although obviously it doesn't really look that different here, but uh, but they have. <laughs> and there we are, charging square into the back of the Dunending Raiders. Oh, getting a, a nice amount of kills. battling away and it's all going on in the center there forces of Dol Guldur meeting the forces of Isengard and the Nazkai oh we didn't see if they threw their bombs did we but anyway there we are I'm going to end the episode there so thank you very much for watching if indeed you have I do hope you've enjoyed this I do hope you you're looking forward to the changes for version 2.3 the cold north or the bitter north or the whatever north <laughs> and uh, until we speak again dear friends Navarre and Perimad Melunin and farewell.